Okay, you know this section, but let's read it with fresh eyes. John 21, conversation down at verse 15 between Jesus and Simon Peter. All right, so this is on the other side of the resurrection. The, the apostles, are, they went out fishing, and the Lord said, you know, throw the net over there, come back to the shore. Jesus already got lunch ready for them before the fish get to the shore, which is interesting. And, um, and then verse 15. So when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my lambs. Verse 16. Jesus says to Peter again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. Verse 17. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to gird yourself and walk wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will gird you and bring you where you do not wish to go. Now this he said, signifying by what kind of death he would glorify God, what kind of death Peter would glorify God. And when Jesus has spoken this, he said to him, to Peter, follow me. Okay? Now, I would guess that in the messages that you've heard on this passage, it focused on two issues. One, it focused on um, the variations in the word love. How many of you have heard a message on the variations in the word love? Okay. Or it focused on the, the differences between tend, shepherd, and tend in terms of the command to Peter about what to do. Okay. We're not going to focus on either one of those tonight. I want you to focus on the word no. Each time in 15, 16, and 17, Peter responds, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Verse 16, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And verse 17, he says it twice. He said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And uh, what struck me about this passage is that the... Uh, while the emphasis tonight, you may be thinking, is on how much you know coming to this midterm, uh, I would encourage you to be caught up maybe in what Christ knows about you. Because each of the three times Peter says, well, Lord, you know how much I love you. Three times he repeats it. There's, there's several things repeated three times. But each time Peter's response is, Lord, you ask me a question that you already know the answer to. You just ask me again, and you already know the answer to. And so the, what struck me about that is that um, here's my question for you. What does Christ know about you? What does he know about me? When Peter says, well, Lord, you know. You know whether or not I love you. You know whether or not I'm willing to follow you. You know how much of my life is yours and how much isn't. You know that stuff, Lord. And so the question I think what I would turn around is, we, we know what we know, and you, I'm sure you're all very well prepared for this uh, midterm tonight, but really the more important question is, what does the Lord know about us? Where, where are our hearts? What, what is it that we really, when we think about God, what we think about? And how that shapes that willingness on our part to be that servant for him. Because um, I have no doubt that uh, you will do fine on this exam. Because you've worked hard. But this is really just a part of a much bigger puzzle, which is not what we know what the Lord knows about us. So, let's pray. Lord, I just thank you that you do know us. Lord, in some ways that's kind of a scary thing to me. Because you know, uh, you know the stuff that looks good to other people, but you also know the reality of the kind of person we are that, by ourselves. And uh, the crazy and some not so honoring thoughts that run through our head, Lord, that only you do know about. And we know it as well. But Lord, you love us. You love us. And Lord, that's just remarkable to me that you would love us with a perfect love in the face of the knowledge that you have about us. We are inconsistent. We fall.
fumble, we goof up, and sometimes we're out and out rebellious. Yet you love us, and you continue to love us. Lord, that is such an awesome truth that no matter how we do tonight on this test, it will not affect your love for us one bit. You will continue to love us with an infinite love. Lord, that is so awesome to know that. Lord, I pray that you would bring a calmness and a peace to each one tonight. And Lord, uh, they prepare. And Lord, allow their minds to be able to pull back all the facts and, and whatever else to bring it to, to bear tonight on this uh, exam. And Lord, thank you. Thank you that you know us and that you love us. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Um, so uh, the overview was the diagram that you copied last time. And by the way, early returns are you did really well on your tests. And my determination was if there was a single point on there that everybody you missed, I was going to discount it. So far, that hasn't been the case. <laughs> <laughs> but if there was one, it was a ringer, and uh, you, you all missed it. I was just going to not make it part of the test. So. But, um, I'll learn by asking the questions. So. OK, uh, so you have that on your notes. Page 41. So we'll pick it up right here. It's on page 41. You have this definition. The virgin birth, better to identify it as a virgin conception, since the miracle applies only to the conception. The birth was a normal event. Other than that, was it? Yeah, in the manger and yeah, a few other things, the angels and all that. But I mean, it wasn't. So, virgin conception. Um, so this is the, the key verse, as you know, and if you turn there, please, to Isaiah 7, Isaiah 7, 14. Okay, Isaiah 7, 14. Uh, Let's actually, if you're there in the text, let's go back to verse 10. Let's read 10 through 15. And, uh, Amanda, would you read that, please? Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol, or as high as heaven. But Ahaz says, I will not ask, and I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men, that you weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey, when he knows how to refuse evil and choose the good. Okay, so uh, Ahaz is under threat from uh, two other rulers, and the Lord says, I'm going to deliver you. And then in verse 11, the Lord says, ask a sign, so that you can know that my promise is true. Make it as tough as you want to make it, verse 11, that's my paraphrase. Verse 12, Ahaz says, nope, I'm not going to ask the Lord. I'm not going to test the Lord. And then verse 13, the Lord gets a, a little upset with Ahaz. He says, listen now, house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men? And you're going to try God's patience as well? God wanted him to ask for a sign, and he wouldn't do it. Which just reminds me, sometimes God wants to bless us, and we will not let him do it. Can you imagine if we would do something like that? Well, that was kind of the case with Ahaz here. So... The Lord determines what the sign will be, and that's where verse 14 is. So you need to understand the context. Ahaz is in trouble. The Lord promises deliverance. And um, Ahaz, rather than asking for a sign, the Lord just says, well, this is going to be the sign. Verse 14, the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is it. Behold, the virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Okay? In your notes. Two interpretations. The first interpretation, and, your, and the overhead has more information on it than your notes do. So please fill in your notes with the information that's on the overhead. I, rather than having listened to my voice, I thought I'd just type it out on the overhead. So the first interpretation is that that prophecy that a, a virgin would have a child uh, was literally fulfilled in Isaiah's day and typically fulfilled in Jesus. Now typically would be better if I said typically, because we're talking about a type. Okay? Everybody remember what a type is? 
Okay, a type is a, a foreshadowing, a prefiguring of a deeper spiritual truth. So Moses was a type of Jesus Christ. The uh, captivity in Egypt was a type of, of uh, the slavery to sin before we are set free. All right, and so there are many types in Scripture. The high priest was a type of Christ, and he's there. All right, so when you see typically, think typically. It's type, all right? So interpretation one, that uh, the virgin born to a child was literally fulfilled in Isaiah's day. There was a virgin who had a child, and then as a type, it was fulfilled in Jesus Christ um, at, at his own birth, all right? So issues related to that first interpretation. First one is the word for virgin. The word for virgin in the uh, Hebrew is the word Alma. It is a young woman of marriageable age. Um, it is also used of women who are morally chaste in the Bible. It does not demand virginity. Okay? That's a key point. It does not demand virginity. And there is a word in the Hebrew that speaks only of virginity. That word wasn't used. Okay? So, the first interpretation says, well, it could have been fulfilled in Isaiah's day, but it wouldn't have been a virgin in the way that we think of a virgin. It would have been, it's sometimes used of women who are just morally chaste. And so a morally chaste woman will have a child. Because it doesn't demand virginity. So in other words, it could have happened in Isaiah's day, and it wouldn't have appeared to be a miracle. But where, where's the sign in that? And you need to know that in Isaiah 7.14, the Septuagint, Anybody remember what the Septuagint is? Okay, Greek translation of the uh, Old Testament from about uh, 350 or 250 BC. Um, it the Greek translation uses a Greek word for virgin here. It's, it's not as ambiguous as Alma is in the Hebrew. It is a virgin. Okay, not that the Greek, Greek translates is definitive, but just to know that that's what they used. they would have not have seen interpretation one as being valid. Okay. Interpretation two. Uh, okay, I, I'm still finishing up uh, on your notes there. The context. Um, the context follows is that uh, this miracle, if it was literally fulfilled in Isaiah's day, then it's restricted to the time period of Ahaz. And it, its future fulfillment then is, it would have to be a type and under that. And uh, it would have to be specific to the content to be fulfilled in Isaiah's day. The problem is, is that, that uh, we don't have any clear record of its fulfillment at the time of Ahaz or when Isaiah spoke it. We have either its fulfillment in Jesus Christ or its type in Jesus Christ, but we, have, we don't have a... a a, a woman of, that was an extraordinary birth that would have been a sign. What, what's the sign about a, a woman who is chaste having a child? That's not necessarily much of a sign for us. Um, I think interpretation two is the stronger interpretation. Um, so let's go to that one. Interpretation two is that... Yes? Well, I was going to say, other than you have verse 15 and 16, how do you put those in with verse... But we don't have to go into that now. Well, uh, let's check with, with this interpretation. It was literally fulfilled in Christ's day. We actually, that's a cornerstone of our faith. That Jesus was born of a virgin. That was a literal fulfillment. That actually a virgin shall be with child, and that's Mary and Jesus. And it was typically, or as a type, fulfilled in Ahaz's time. In other words, um, reverse the first one. Okay, so, uh, and that fits the context, because, for instance, the meaning of sign, and you have this on the next page. Customarily in the Old Testament, a sign is a miraculous act, or a miraculous event. That is the common, customary meaning of a sign in the Old Testament. So, for it to be a sign that would have spoken to uh, Ahaz, it would have had to have been a miraculous event. Well, it was a miraculous event, clearly, when Jesus was born as a virgin. So that's the literal fulfillment. Um, and then again, we have the, the second issue here is the meaning of Emmanuel. 
Well, Emmanuel is used a couple more times in the book of Isaiah. If you flip over to chapter 8, verse 8, Emmanuel is used another time. And uh, it's actually used twice in chapter 8. And uh, that gives us maybe a clue to, uh, is this meant to, to be a future prophecy or fulfilled in Isaiah's time? The way that it's used in chapter 8, verse 8, um, it's, a, it's a prophecy about uh, the um, Assyrians coming in. If you go down to verse 7, Therefore, behold, the Lord is about to bring on them the strong and abundant waters of the Euphrates, even the king of Assyria in all his glory. It will rise up over all its channels and go over its banks, and then it, or the Assyrian invasion, Verse 8 will sweep on into Judah. It will overflow and pass through, much like a river overflowing its banks. It will reach even to the neck, and the spread of its wings will fulfill the breath of your land, O Emmanuel. And there, Emmanuel refers to the land of Israel. Go to verse 10, though. Chapter 8, verse 10. Devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand for, and that's actually the word Emmanuel. Some of your translations have God is with us. Okay, but it's the word Emmanuel, right? So the word Emmanuel occurs twice in the next chapter. Um, and so, um, who does it refer to in Isaiah's time, in Ahaz's time? You know, it's, it, it's used in other contexts here, so we can't say it refers specifically to a person, because it's used to refer to, we're not sure in verse 8, in verse 10, it sounds like, it, in both cases, it actually sounds like it's Israel. So... Is it referred to Isaiah's kid? No, that doesn't really fit. So, for a literal fulfillment in Isaiah's time, that's that's a problem, the meaning of Emmanuel. And um, then, of course, in the original prophecy in uh, 7.14, notice that it says, uh, in verse 13, then he said, Listen now, O house of David. Well, when you bring in the house of David, it takes it out of the narrow realm of Ahaz and opens it up to probably a wider understanding. Um, and so, it, but probably the strongest evidence that it was a type in Ahaz's time and a literal fulfillment in the time of Jesus Christ is this statement by Matthew in Matthew 1, 22 and 23. You have the statement in your notes, you don't have the notation that it's Matthew 1, 22 and 23. Matthew says, Now all this took place that what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, you know, it's the prophet Isaiah, might be fulfilled. Jesus Christ's virgin birth was a fulfillment of prophecy. So we know that by the New Testament writer's commentary on that passage in Isaiah, that it was meant to be fulfilled and was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. If that's a little too confusing, just... Uh, Put a star by interpretation number two is probably the stronger of the two for these reasons. Um, but that brings us to an issue about fulfillment. And uh, you just have on your notes a note prophetic. You have typical, double, or partial. And this um, fills that out a little bit uh, for what you have in your notes. Typical or type fulfillment is very common, right? Jesus Christ. We have the type of the priesthood of Melchizedek. We have the type of the sacrifice, the sacrificial lamb, the Passover lamb in the, from the book of Exodus. So we saw a lot of type fulfillment. Partial fulfillment is also acceptable. In other words, there are messianic prophecies that have only been partly fulfilled, and we're still waiting for some of them to be completely fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Double fulfillment, though, has a problem, and that's... Where does that relate to our passage? There was a virgin who had a child in Ahaz's time, and then Jesus Christ was that. So that would be like a double fulfillment. The problem with double fulfillment is when does it stop being fulfilled? I mean, how do we know it's only a double, and not a triple, and not a quadruple? And then also, there's a lot of discussion as to when actually does it get fulfilled. It's more, much more open-ended to say, well, it was fulfilled then, and it's fulfilled now, and maybe again and again and again. And so the double fulfillment is a problem. And the double being at the time that it was spoken and then at some later date or multiple later dates. If it happens all the time, how can we call it a prophecy? Yeah, it's something else. Yeah. So, uh, again, strong support for the second interpretation that 
the prophecy from Isaiah 7.14 was fulfilled as a type in Ahaz's day, fulfilled literally in Jesus Christ. Um, and then, uh, it's, oh, go back. Scroll it. Use the ball. I am. Let me try it again. Which way is that going to go? No, it's going for home drive. There we go. I'm trying to allow this one more. One more back. Okay. Okay. Um, for this to be a prophecy, we don't need to have it fulfilled in the same time. But the, evidence that it was well, there's no evidence that it was fulfilled as in the same way that it was for Jesus Christ. But then again, the first interpretation would say, well, that's not demanded because of the, the meaning of Alma, and now it's you. So, you know, just just so you know, because these issues, as we we're going to get uh, to the, uh, the the humanity of Jesus Christ here, this issue comes up. Was he fully human? Well, it has so much to do with this initial prophecy about it. Everybody got it? Yes. Okay. Thank you. It's kind of interesting, too, that liberal theologians suddenly get very um, interested in the Old Testament and how accurate it is because it uses that word. Right. Yeah. Okay, the virgin birth. It is affirmed in the Gospels. Uh, Matthew, I'm going to give you two here, and on your notes you can see one in Matthew. Matthew tends to stress Jacob's, uh, excuse me, Joseph's skepticism and Luke stresses Mary's skepticism. Um, but uh, here's just a summary of the quotes uh, from Matthew, all in chapter 1. Joseph, of the husband of Mary, by whom was born Jesus, who was called to Christ, child conceived by the Holy Spirit, fulfilled the virgin will conceive. He kept her a virgin. So the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy is pretty well nailed down in Matthew. You've got all that in your notes. And then uh, again in Luke. The virgin will conceive, the Holy Spirit will overshadow, being supposedly the son of Joseph, um, giving a hint that it's not the son of Joseph, the only other possibility of being um, either someone else's son or the virgin birth, the fulfillment of Isaiah 7.14. Uh, you do not have these notes under the phrase theological significance there right before the baptism heading. Was the virgin birth necessary? It's necessary that Jesus be fully God and fully man. The virgin birth is the mechanism, if you will, for fully man. And our salvation hinges on both of these truths, fully God and fully man. Why? Only God can forgive our sins, and only man can die. And uh, we will see that th this position that is necessary that Jesus Christ be fully God and fully man is, well, you read it in your notes. Uh, it's challenged, it has been challenged for centuries to undermine what the scriptures teach about the person of Jesus Christ, that he was fully God and fully man. And, and so I just wanted to address, why is it significant? Why, why is the virgin birth important? The virgin birth is necessary because it establishes the humanity of Jesus Christ. And, and the virgin birth was how Jesus became fully a man, and our salvation hinges on that as well as the fact that he's fully God. Very important. in your notes, purpose of John's baptism with Jesus. In general, John baptizes on page 43 at the top. 
John baptized for repentance to spiritually prepare the people for Messiah's coming. This did not apply to Jesus, of course, and is the reason John was reluctant to baptize him. Uh, Jesus didn't need to repent. For John, baptizing Messiah would bring about a sign which would indicate Messiah had come. Uh, for Jesus, the baptism fulfilled all righteousness, suggesting that it was part of the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy regarding the anointing and ministry of Messiah. Um, just a note before I read that next section. Uh, we had a baptism, we had two baptisms on this last Sunday after church. And um, I had, uh, before we went down, we went down to the lake, and uh, it was a father and son. And uh, before the baptism, I had another fellow in the church come up to me, and, and he said, well, I need to know whether or not I should get baptized. I said, okay, um, tell me, you know, have you been baptized before? He said, yeah. I said, so when were you baptized? And uh, he said, when I was 10 years old. I said, did you believe Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life at age 10? He said, I'm sure I did at 10. But he said, the window came off my life at about 13. <coughs> and uh, for about 40 years, <coughs> so this man's about 70 now, for about 40 years, uh, no one could have known that I was a Christian. I did not live for the Lord in any way. Do I need to be baptized? Because he's, you know, he's uh, come back to come back to the the church and to uh, walking with the Lord and uh, families there. But there was a big chunk of his life where that wasn't the case. And uh, he said, do I need to be baptized? And so I answered him according to this right here. I said, well, if, if you're asking me do you need to be baptized for uh, the, the command in Matthew uh, 28, Go therefore into all nations, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I commanded you. Um, if that, if you were truly uh, a follower of Jesus Christ through faith, um, then that baptism is sufficient. And then I explained to him the baptism that John did. I said, John baptized for repentance. And uh, it sounds to me like uh, after a long time of rebellion in your life, you have repented and come back to the Lord. And he shook his head and he said, yeah, that's exactly what's happened. I said, well, you know what? You don't need to be baptized for salvation. But if it would be important to you to be baptized as a mark of repentance, I'd be glad to do that. And so I left it up to him, but tried to clarify the issue as you have it here with the two different baptisms. Because John was not baptizing for salvation. He was baptizing for repentance. Yeah. So, and Jesus wasn't repenting. Uh, it was more fulfilling all righteousness. Uh, the Trinitarian significance, we've talked about this. Uh, all three members of the Trinity were present. And the Messianic significance, the phrase, this is my beloved son, is seen as a partial illusion. Uh, its fulfillment is in Psalm 2 7. We've talked about Psalm 2 7. Another prophetic pro proclamation of Christ's divine sonship. Um, and then you have a further note that I did not copy on here that's in your notes there. One should note that Jesus did not become the Son of God here, as some critics suggest. In other words, he became God's Son on the day he was baptized. Rather, his divine sonship is being publicly proclaimed for the first time. Turn to uh, Luke chapter 9. Let's just read the Transfiguration. Transfiguration. Jerusalem. But Peter and those that were with him 
were heavy with sleep. And when they were awake, they saw, when they woke up, they saw his glory and the two men that stood with him. And it came to pass, as they departed from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was still speaking, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. And there came a voice out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone, and they kept it close and told no one in those days uh, any of those things which they had seen. Okay, thank you. Um, it's interesting, Luke uh, is a little unique in the way that he does this. In the, verse 27 immediately precedes this, and so some wonder, what's the fulfillment of Luke, verse 27? The next nine verses are the fulfillment. Um, some standing here shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. When would that happen? Well, it happened eight days later. And the sum would be three, Peter, James, and John. They, they had a glimpse of the kingdom of God. So it's really kind of Jesus' kind of preliminary comment on what happened here. Um, according to your notes, the purpose of the event that Jesus made, uh, excuse me, the meaning of the event, I didn't write it all down. Jesus' change of appearance, white garments, fear producing awe in the disciples suggests the momentary lifting of the veil which shrouded Jesus' true deity. Um, in terms of the purpose of the event, that Jesus may converse with Moses and Elijah concerning his impending death. Uh, the, the question that's often occurred to me is, how did Peter know? <laughs> yeah, you know, if it had just been Luke making the commentary, well, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit could have told it, but it says down in uh, verse 33, Peter says to Jesus, let's make... You know, the tabernacles here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And I've often wondered, you know, name tags? How did he know? They didn't have pictures of these guys. And they don't have a video record to know what Moses looked like or what Elijah looked like. How did he know? Moses! conversation going on. Yeah. Elijah! <laughs> Maybe they were addressing each other. And those two guys lived hundreds of years apart. Um, and uh, interesting, I've often wondered about that. So here they are, those two. But why those two? Look in your notes. To give the disciples a glimpse of the true nature of the Son of God, they didn't fill out the rest of this. The, this affirmed the priority of Jesus over the law represented by Moses and the prophets represented by Elijah and would later become a basis for their eyewitness testimony concerning Jesus' true nature. Okay? Um, but that last reference that you have, I want to turn to that real quick. 2 Peter chapter 1. It's right there at the end of the Transfiguration section, 2 Peter 1, verse 16 through 18. Um, so, uh, 16 through 18, uh, are you there actually? Did you read that? 16 through 18. Okay. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Yeah. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Okay. Pretty strong uh, correlation between Peter, who was there and saw and heard this, his eyewitness testimony. But what's amazing to me is that the next two verses, read 19 and 20 if you would ask them. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. In the next verse. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, 
but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Look closely at the first line of verse 19. Peter seems to be saying, so he just finished with 18, he said, we saw this, we heard this, we were there. We saw Jesus Christ glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration. But verse 19 starts out, but we've got something even more sure than that, than our personal experience of having seen Jesus Christ, which you do well to pay attention to, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises. And then what's he talking about? Verse 20, he's talking about Scripture. Peter, who was an eyewitness of this glorious event of Jesus Christ's life, says, but there's something even more certain that you can count on than me who was there and saw and heard what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, and that is the scriptures that you hold in your hand. That's an amazing statement that Jesus would say, that Peter would say, I was there, I saw it, I heard it, it was an amazing thing, but let me tell you something that's even better. You hold it in your hand. It is God's word given to us. That's a wonderful, amazing statement. <clears throat> okay, let's get to some uh, sticky ones here. Uh, if, you, if you read ahead in your notes, you know what I'm talking about here. Okay, Gethsemane, all right? The, the garden prayer on the night before Jesus went to the cross. You know the prayer. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. It's in three of the Gospels in different forms, but there's the references. You have that in your notes. So there's the prayer. We're familiar with the prayer. What's the problem? Well, the first problem here is Christ's knowledge. Didn't he know about the cross? Notice the, the, the question. Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. A reference to his suffering on the cross. Why is Jesus asking about it? Doesn't he know about it? And then, of course, we have the issue of God's will. Why pray something that could potentially be contrary to God's will? Was it God's will that Jesus die on the cross? Yes, it was. It was God's will that Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of all mankind. So, didn't Christ know that? And if he did know that, why is he praying a prayer that could be potentially contrary to his Father's will? He's showing that he knows exactly how much pain and suffering is going to go Well, how can that be contrary to God's will when you say, if you're willing, do this? Exactly. Uh, because God had already said that there had to be a sacrifice for sin. And if it wasn't going to be Jesus, who was it going to be? So God, had, you know, we've already had, you know, John 3.16 before this. We've had many other passages that say that Jesus Christ is going to die on the cross. He's told his own disciples, I'm going to die on the cross three days. I'm, right later I'm going to rise from the dead. So he's already told them this, and now we get to this part, and he's hanging on the cross, and he's, it's the night before, not hanging on the cross, that's the next one. But it's the night before, he says, well, Father, if there's, if there's another way. That's the knowledge part. Doesn't he know? And, you know, can we change the plan here? Can we change the plan? So, uh, here, here's how the uh, theologians get around this. And I want you to look at their two options. The first one. Christ is praying to avoid, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from you. Praying to avoid the punishment of the cross. This is a traditional view. Uh, one you may have heard before. Um, these notes are not, these... These items are not in your notes. Okay? This is true to you. In his humanity, is there another way to go to the cross, but he's still willing to submit his, to his, his will to the Father's will? Uh, we still have a problem with knowledge. <coughs> Doesn't Jesus know this? But this is a traditional view. He wants to avoid the punishment of the cross. All right? So he's kind of saying there, is there another way to die about it? Without having to be crucified? Yeah. Is there another way to accomplish this without me going through what's going on tomorrow? Right? This is the night before. Yeah. And he knows he's going to be crucified. You know, he, he's lived in this culture. He knows how horrible this death is going to be. And he's... Is there another way to do this? I don't think the physical crucifixion was the thing that he was worried about. Yeah. yeah. And, and I would... Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, actually, I think the second one... Did everybody get these notes down? Uh, I think the second one is the stronger, but this is the traditional view. You ask most people, what does it mean when Jesus said, Father, if you're willing to take this cup from me, but your will be done, he wanted to avoid the punishment. That's probably not, I mean, 
It could be that, but I think the next one is the is the stronger argument. Are we, are we good to switch this? Yeah. Which is not the punishment, but the permanence. Okay, another P word. So Christ is praying to avoid the permanence of the cross. I didn't underline it in your notes, but you may want to underline permanence there. All right. He knows he's going to the cross. He's willing to go to the cross, but he doesn't know the outcome of the cross. In other words, these last questions. Will the punishment of sin be forever? Will I ever be spiritually reunited with you? In other words, this, this solves the issue of the will. He, he, he will do the Father's will. He's not questioning the Father's will or the God changed his plan. He's just not sure what the outcome is going to be. Again, we have the problem of knowledge here. Does Jesus not know what the outcome is going to be? Well, there are certain other things Jesus has claimed not to know. Yeah, but he, did, he has said before this moment that I will be crucified and three days later rise. So he's already told the disciples what's going to happen. Um, so this, neither one of these actually, frankly, are great solutions to that prayer for, for various reasons. It's a seemingly a weird prayer to have him pray. Either he doesn't know what's going to go on, or he's, he's asking God, let's go to plan B. I don't really like this one. Is it, if we can take this cup away from me, let's do it. Or something else. Or something else, okay? So, um, this probably because it gets around the, the knowledge issue, it is probably, I mean, it gets around the will issue. You know, countering his father's will is probably a little bit stronger than the first one, but it still has a problem with knowledge, you know? That you would think that he'd know since he'd already made the prophecy. Uh, these are obscure questions, admittedly. That's, if you ought to know that by now, it's kind of the nature of studying theology. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Jim. So he's up there, Peter, James, and John referencing as well, right? We're back to the Transfiguration? No. no Gethsemane. Garden of Gethsemane. Garden of Gethsemane, great. And, and it says Jesus went a bit further away right. to pray. And they went to sleep. And they went to sleep. Do you think it was before they were just, do you think there's some reason Christ prayed that? It doesn't say he prayed it out loud, but he prayed it out loud for some reason for them? A possibility. Because it doesn't seem like it makes any sense if it's just between him and God. Because well, you, have you know, he's done things before in front of people right. for a reason. Yeah. All right, the reason is for us to know it. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you could use that same line of reasoning with virtually all of chapter 17 of John's Gospel, which is, you know, referred to as a high priestly prayer, but, you know, we don't know if anybody heard that, and you know, it's reported. Um, and we have the well, that's the question, how do we know what Christ prayed, other than, you know, the, the, the whole, that's where the, the whole issue of inspiration comes in here, the Holy Spirit, you know, inspiring this passage here. Anyway. I like the Isaiah there, the imagery of the cup. Yeah. Being God's wrath. Right. So that's you know, interesting. Well, that that is what the imagery of the cup is. Okay. And that's used several times. So when you read the quote, um, Father, if you're willing to remove this cup, he's talking about the wrath of God directed against sin. And so it's like, is there another way? And so we have the issue: Does doesn't Jesus know? Is he willing to ask God to change the plan? And so anyway, here's two attempts to address address that. I don't. From my perspective, neither one of them addresses it very well. Um, I, I'm a little bit dissatisfied with both approaches, but I wanted you to see them. Do, do you have any other third approach? <laughs> do I have a third approach? <laughs> well, he certainly does seem to be, you know, to avoid the punishment of it doesn't, I agree with you on that, Jordan. I, it doesn't seem like a prayer that he would pray. Jesus would do whatever it took because Jesus loved perfectly. One of the, the core definition of agape love is that you do what is in the best interest of the object of your love without counting personal cost. So to avoid punishment seems to negate that key element of agape love. So I don't think that he was wanting to avoid punishment. That's why I think this is slightly stronger, but it has, a, it has some problems as well. Why did he pray that prayer? Why is it recorded for our benefit? Uh, I would say if nothing else, it's recorded for us to glimpse the, if we had any doubts, the full depths of his humanity. You know, what human being, knowing what they were going to go through, wouldn't have doubts, wouldn't, you know, you know, 
kind of mentally be <coughs> anguished about the whole thing. And that also connects to this next one. Doesn't he also know that God is going to turn him back on him? Oh, um, that's the rapid part. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the rapid part. We're going to get to that in the, under the crucifixion. So, I've mentioned some of these already. Full solution to solve the problems, that is a knowledge problem exists for both. The advantage of the second solution is that it solves the problem of the conflict of wills. He just doesn't know how long it's going to last. The passage shows the very real side of Christ's nature and shows the reality of his, his anguish. And it also shows us that there was no other way. There was no other way. That's For right. our benefit, we found out there is no other way. I guess from a greater standpoint, answering the obvious question is good greater. Well, you know, the, the fact that there is no other way takes us all back to Genesis chapter 2. <clears throat> there will be death. Sin will require death. Ultimately, the death of the, of the Son of God is what sin required for us to be reconciled to God again. So, so all that with no answer. Okay. Okay. It's, we see a lot of this. <laughs> you do, yeah. You read, you read Ryrie, you run into this stuff all the time, don't you? But you know what? It will cause you to, I hope, uh, to, you know, to come to these questions maybe a little more open-minded rather than think, well, I've always been told this. You know, but is there another point of view? Well, there are other points of view. Here's the strengths and here's the weaknesses of both points of view. And I think that's, that is a healthy exercise, I think, to uh, bring to uh, the study of God's Word. Um, so let's, let's look at the, the, the last phrase here, which is in the crucifixion. You have it in your notes on page 44. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Um, so, go ahead. Isn't that also the start of Psalm 22? Uh, yes, it is. Psalm 22, it is. So it's a, it's, and that's part of the uh, solution here. It's, it's a fulfillment of prophecy. So, the, the problem. In what sense is Jesus, the divine Son, forsaken by God? And is that a Trinitarian contradiction? Three Same. persons in one God. In what sense can one God forsake himself? himself? Exactly. What does that mean? My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In other words, so there's, there's the problem. And how do we understand that? What, what way was Jesus Christ forsaken? And does that undermine our understanding, limited as it is, of the, the way the Trinity works? So, a couple of insights. Linguistically. I say linguistic or lingui? <laughs> Linguistically. Right. Jesus addresses God as God, not as Father. All right? So in terms of the Trinitarian aspect of it, it doesn't address him as the Father, which would have been a natural, you know, my the Son, I'm this is my Son, I'm well pleased, my Father. That, that, would, that was the most common uh, way that Jesus addressed the third person of the Trinity, was Father, okay, but not here. My God, my God, not my Father, my Father. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then... Uh, The biblical insight, as uh, Mitchell pointed out. It is a part of the fulfillment of Psalm 22 1. He's not really crying out in irrational anguish. He's specifically quoting a scripture, uh, st stressing his complete fulfillment at every uh, point. So, um, in your notes, you have these theological implications. Oh, what happened there? We have you. Here it is. No? Oh, no. There it is. Nope. That's <laughs> I'm going to go... Okay, well, I'll just read it to you. Um, you have this in your notes. Um, on the service, it does stress the human anguish of Jesus. Um, that's important. The cry addresses Elohim, not Abba. We made that point earlier. Elohim would have been God. Abba is, a, is the, the father. Stressing a temporary st separation that did occur between uh, father and son due to Jesus becoming sin for us. I have dough there. <laughs> it's due. I need someone to do a spell check on me when I type these things. I don't think it's still come out. The spell check would not help you in that. No, no, no that's right. right. That's a word for you. And the darkness of the hour is a symbolic picture of the cry, um, the darkness. Um, 
It's important to distinguish the Father from the Son. You may have remembered earlier we talked about patripassionism. Um, and the reason it's important to distinguish Father from Son and understand the Trinity and redemption and failure because patripassionism uh, is a heresy. The Father died on the cross, right? One God, so God, Father died on the cross. Um, Father, passion. The same which Christ underscores a difference between the members of the Trinity. Um, and then, of course, it concludes with uh, divine reconciliation as Jesus ends his appeal and goes back to Father. Right? Notice, please, look back to Abba. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Can you explain exactly how it underscores the difference? Because uh, he says, Father, why hast thou forsaken me? Yeah, God, why, why have you forsaken me? So there's a distinction between the two persons, one, you know, remaining and one being forsaken. And then we see the reconciliation into my hands, I, into your hands I commit my spirit. You know, I don't know that we understand, but uh, these are some of those phrases that, you know, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What does that mean? In what sense did the Father forsake? Um, you know, I'm sure you probably heard it expressed in some ways, God just turned his back so to speak, on sin. As Jesus bore the sins of the world. Well, isn't that the logical conclusion? Because God, but God he, cannot be in the presence of sin. Yes. So, so he really couldn't, perhaps, turn his back, as a, you know, figuratively speaking. He doesn't have a back. Well, he turns his back. Okay, but not only present. He takes himself out of the presence of that. But how does that work within the context of the Trinity? Well, maybe it's oh, well, how can it not? You know, maybe well, like it's his omnipresence and he's, a, you know, know. he's even can see hell, right? right? Except that doesn't mean he's, you know, it doesn't mean that they're completely, like, like you know, you can't see him or anything like that, right. except maybe you disconnect on that nature, I don't know. But, you know, so, you know, but all of these explanations would kind of go to underscore for a moment or for three hours, whatever, however you would take it while it was darkness. Was there some kind of fracture in the Trinity relationship? Do we, we have to postulate that kind of an idea to understand why hast thou forsaken me? Well, like I said, wouldn't it have to be? In order for, for, for all the sins born by Jesus, God came, couldn't be present at that mm -hmm. time as part of Jesus couldn't be part of God at that time. Part of the answer here, I think, is in our next section, which is the hypostatic union, which is the fully God, fully man section. Because I think part of the answer here is that Jesus Christ bore the sins as a human. God didn't die. A man named Jesus Christ died on the cross. God didn't die. And the hypostatic union, which is very difficult for us to really get our head around, uh, kind of addresses that oh, issue. Oh, yeah. The rest, the, rest of is, the rest of us is simple. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so the fact that uh, it's, like, it's like your plan to you open up to the next question. Yeah. You keep getting, you know, yeah. Peeling the layers off the onion. Just find more onion, right? More onion. Yeah. Does the, the um, position of judge play in this discussion? In what way? God is not a judge or cannot be judged. It has to be, and therefore he turns his back on sin because he doesn't know what to do with it, or he, or he, doesn't, he doesn't know how to handle it exactly. Um, and he takes, because for a man, it takes a, a, a human judge. For a judge of said human experience. Uh, if you're asking which member of the Trinity will judge sin? No. No. Why did he turn his back on Jesus? Uh -huh. Because Jesus is representing sin. And he could not, uh, he did not have the uh, attributes to righteously judge sin in man. Jesus does. So he had to turn his back on it. Okay. Yeah, I can make them up pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, here's one for you. And you may have read ahead on this one. In what form does Jesus Christ exist today? Right at this moment. In what form 
Does Jesus Christ exist today? Oh, Holy Ghost. What form? Uh, what form? He has the right to pick and choose. He has the right to pick and choose. He has the right to pick and choose. In both forms, as man and God, as man and in the resurrected body. Is there, does Jesus Christ have a physical body like you and I right now? Not like us, no. But like what we will have. That we know. The key word there was physical as opposed to immaterial. So you have a physical body ascension now. He did. When last we saw him, he had a resurrection. Yeah, he had a resurrection. But he comes back, so I, I don't know if it just got just you know dematerialized and it's going to rematerialize. Or okay, here's the hint. All right, I want you to think theologically. The hint is in the phrase it's in First Corinthians 15, first fruits. In, in, in Acts 1. In Acts 1. This same. First fruits. So, first fruits is an indication that, you know, the, the promise of more to follow in the same way. Mm -hmm. So, the, Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead is the first fruits from the dead. He's resurrected with a body. We will not be in heaven and be immaterial spirits. We will have bodies. Right. Jesus Christ has a body today. He was recognized after his In heaven, yes. So Jesus Christ exists even though he is the God-man, and he's still the God-man in glory, where we will be also one day. So the answer is a little bit of a trick question, but the answer is, is that um, one understanding of the hypostatic union, fully God, fully man, is that he's still fully God, fully man. Neither one of those ceased at his death and resurrection and ascension. He's still fully God and fully man. We will not be fully God, but we will be fully what we were meant to be within our resurrection bodies, and we will see him, see him with our physical eyes. We will see him because he will have physical bodies just as we will. So while he was lying in the tomb, his physical body is there. Yeah. We're assuming his spirit, soul, at that one will. They were going to talk about that. Had left. Mm -hmm. In some ways, we don't know. I don't know. He was having a dinner party with that team. And then, <laughs> well, that's true, because that day they'd be together. So, but, In paradise. So when he was resurrected, the body that left the tomb was the new resurrected body. Mm -hmm. It's where he says the prototypical uh, reincarnate body. And that's how he entered the... That's how you chain would have to come into the door and that's right. time and space continuum and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, but he ate food. But he ate food. Yeah. And they could touch him. They could touch him. And their, their hands didn't pass through. He said, go ahead and touch the hole. Yeah, he passed through the wall. He, he passed through the wall. But so, we, you know, First Corinthians 15 is a fascinating study about the resurrection body. And, and, and here's I, what I can tell you about your resurrection body. One, it will bear very, very little resemblance to the body you have right now, but it will be physical. Two, you will be unique and recognizable. We will still know each other. But it will bear the same resemblance to the body that you have now that a giant fir tree bears to a seed. Um. He came, I guess it is for clear that the 40 days he walked around, he did not necessarily have the new body. Yeah, he did. He yeah. did? Yeah. Well, then he had to be the same size. Because everybody recognized him. Well, no, I don't think. mean in terms of being, I, I didn't say by, I mean, in comparison, I wasn't saying he was the size of a Um. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. He was recognizable sometimes, but other times he was not recognizable. Right? Yeah. right? Yeah, but the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, they had no idea what they were talking about. <coughs> but I, does it say they were blinded? Or they were... They it just says that you're saying is it's it's like the seed the tree. Yeah. It's, like, it's going to be a lot better than what we got now. It, and it's, now there's going to be a correspondence body. between the body you have now and the body that you get, but it's going to be... You know, between a seed and a rose, it's going to be, and that's the analogy that Paul said, uses. He says, between the seed and what grows from it, th there is a correspondence, but it's going to be very different, but recognizable and 
physical. And that's why, here, here's the good part for those of you who love this creation. The new heavens and the new earth is physical. We will live in a physical place. New Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. It's a physical place. We will have physical bodies. We're not going to go sit on a cloud someplace. You're right, you play a harp. <laughs> so are there going to be those who are in heaven and those who are on earth? Uh, Since there's a new heaven and a new, 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 new earth. No, they, you know, from Revelation we know that if you're not with the Lord, you're not heaven. You know, you're in the lake of fire. Yeah. At a place of uh, eternal torment. So God. God dwells with man on the earth. Yeah. That's Revelation. So, so here's, where, the heaven. here's where this comes to play. A woman calls me up uh, yesterday and she says, uh, my 92-year-old mother is about a week from death. The doctor's only given her a few weeks. And I've known this woman for some years. And she said, please go talk to my mom. So I went over and I talked to her. She was in a nursing home. And I talked to her and I, I, you know, I said, uh, LaVon, it sounds like the doctors are saying that you're going to... And she's very, very ill. She's 92. And... Um, she said, yeah, that's what they're telling me. And I said, LaVon, do you, it's really, I love to talk to people who are about to die. Because you just cut through all the baloney that you can't really do with your coworker or your friend, you know. You just cut through all the baloney and you say, okay, you're within just a few days of standing before God. And then I can talk, just ask them questions. Just like we're talking about right here. Just say, so, you know, and just, are you ready? And then, you know, they'll either come up with some baloney about I'll be in a better place and then you can just pull out God's word and just say well that's only possible if Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior through faith otherwise you will not be in a better place you'll be in a place too horrible to even contemplate I can't say that to people who are going to live for another third. I mean I, I wish I could but it doesn't always work out that way but uh, yeah so I was able to hear this woman's story she had an interesting story I'll just